Claude Rains with Ray Collins in a new play about Tom Paine called In This Crisis on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Those are words of Thomas Paine, written more than a century and a half ago, in such a crisis as America faces again today. Those words and Tom Paine who wrote them are the subject of our play tonight. This play, written by Robert Richards, is about a true story and about a legend. But Tom Paine would say that it is true. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents In This Crisis, with Ray Collins as the stranger and starring Claude Rains as Tom Paine. It is New York in the year 1809. In an upstairs room of a little house on Grove Street, an old man, sick and bedridden, waits for the darkness to come. His housekeeper, Madame Bovee, speaks to him. Hello. Now there. Are you quite comfortable, Mr. Oh, quite, Madame Bovee. Quite, thank you. Now, is there anything else I can do, Mr. Nothing, thank you. The front door locks. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Payne. Good. I don't want to be annoyed by a lot of lunatics bursting in here as I was yesterday. No. I'm not wrong. Yes, Mr. Payne. Good evening, Tom Payne. Good evening. Huh? Oh. Good evening. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Tom Payne? Let me see. You came to see me last night. Winter. 1776. That was the last time, wasn't it? Monsieur Payne. Who uh, is eh? Who is that you are talking to? Do you want to... Uh, it's all right, Madame Bonfi. It's all right. It's just an old friend. How did he get in? The door is locked. Oh, he let himself in. Now you go on with your supper and leave us alone. Yes. Yes, Monsieur Payne. So. You've come back. To chat for an hour or two with an old friend and watch the sun go down. To watch the sun go down. You know, I think I'm dying. You are, Tom Payne. I find it hard to accept you at all sometimes. I don't believe in miracles, you know. Oh, come now, Tom Payne. You're something of a miracle yourself. I am? Yes, you, from an impoverished tax collector to a leader of one of the great social and political movements of all the ages. Oh, an uptown pain, that's a miracle you believe in, isn't it? I believe in myself, yes, but I, I don't believe in things I can't see. You see me sitting over here, don't you? Come to think of it. You know, I've never seen you distinctly. Do you remember the first time? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was appearing in Parliament, representing the king's excise men, poor devils, trying to get them... Better pay. It was your first real fight. And you were a little frightened. Parliament, the king's ministers, you were waiting to be summoned. Everyone was giving you advice. No, Tom, don't forget. They will take you before their lordship. I know, I know. Bar and scrape. Well, Tom, that's how it is. That's how it's always been. Well, you do want me to mention, I suppose, that if we don't get better wages, we shall starve. Well, to be sure, Tom, to be sure. But delicately, delicately. Shh. Mr. Thomas Payne? I am Mr. Thomas Payne. The lordships will see you now, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Remember now, Tom. Delicately, delicately. This way. Remove your hat, please, Mr. Payne. The lords and ministers, the petitioner, Thomas Payne. Step up, Mr. Payne. Step up. 
No. What is it? My lord, I... I come before you as a petitioner for His Majesty's officers of excise. We are aware of that, Mr. Payne. I must ask you to be as brief as possible. I shall be brief, my lords. In all loyalty and in all humility, His Majesty's officers of excise wish to call to your lordship's attention the fact that their wages were set by law nearly 100 years ago. And they never once in all that time been readjusted. It is no longer possible for these officers to live as honorable, self-respecting men on what they now receive. Mr. Payne, is your purpose here to obtain an increase in the salaries of His Majesty's officers of excise? It is, my lord. Mm. For myself, I am disinclined to hear more. If the salaries of these officers have been adequate for nearly 100 years, it is the most powerful of arguments that they are still adequate today. Am I right, my lord? Quite right. Very definitely. Yes. Yes. And as to honesty, Mr. Payne, you will find that we have very positive means of enforcing that. Eh, my lord? <laughs> I think that will be all, Mr. Payne. All? Am I to understand, my lord, that this is all you have to say? Do you question our verdict, Mr. Payne? Question it? I not only question it, I question your right to render it. And before God, I'll find out one day how it is that some men are born with the right to enslave others who may not even question their enslavement. Oh, Mr. Payne, you may consider your service to the crown at an end as of this day. I had already so considered it. Well, how was it? Will the old boys give us another quid or two? I'll give you nothing. But what did they say? They said that what was good enough for your great-grandfathers is good enough for you. In short... They said no. Well, come along, lads. We'd best be getting on. Sorry I failed you. You did the best you could, Tom. Well, um, we'll see you back at Lewis, eh? Yes, I suppose I shall be back at Lewis. Good evening, Tom. Good evening. Good evening. I, um... Uh, it's so dark. I'm afraid I don't recognize you. No matter. I am sent by a compliment of yours. Countryman of mine? Yes, an American. Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Oh, then you're mistaken, sir. I know Dr. Franklin, but I've never been in America in my life. But you have been thinking about going to America, haven't you? Why? Yes. I know a good deal about that country, Tom Payne. Uh, Dr. Franklin has spoken to me somewhat about America. Yes, but I flatter myself that I know even more. Oh, don't misunderstand me. But I have a curious knack of knowing what men will do tomorrow. You're something of a prophet, then? In a small way, yes. Where are you? Time enough for that. The point is, you have been wishing that there were others who believe as you do, that you might find them and talk with them, and together with them, seek out some better way of life. Yes. I have wished that. With all my heart. Suppose I were to tell you that there are such men in America. Who are you? You come to me speaking in English. How am I to believe? Because you are a man who knows the sound of truth. Listen. In their hearts, the men of America are saying this to each other. That all men are created equal, endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you believe that, Tom Payne? It's enough to be a battle cry for a whole new race of men. One day it will be. By the way, Tom Payne, there is a ship called the London Packet leaving very soon for Philadelphia. I will only sure that this is not a dream. It is a dream, Tom Payne. But every forward step that men have ever taken since they lived in caves have started as a dream. Would I meet you again in America? Often, I think. Remember, Tom Payne, I promise nothing. But this can be a beginning. If you wish it. I do. Wish it. to Claude Rains on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, Tom Payne has arrived in America, is now the editor of a magazine in Philadelphia. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Payne, I was just thinking of you. 
You are certainly to be congratulated, sir. Am I, Mr. Aitken? Ah, uh, do you realize, sir, that since you have been editing the Pennsylvania magazine, its circulation has nearly tripled? I think perhaps congratulations for that are due more to you as owner than to me as editor. <laughs> come, come now, Payne. The credit's yours. I meant, sir, that it's the business of an owner to be concerned about the profits of his publication. It's the business of an editor to be concerned about the contents. Why, uh, yes. So it is, I suppose, in a way. Our contents have been most unprofitable lately, Mr. Aitken. What? Well, not to my mind, Mr. Aitken. There's a smell of powder in the air. The smell of anger on every April breeze, and we give space to men who still believe the world is fair. We will not tolerate these rumors of rebellion. It is our policy, the policy of an ostrich. I am in business. Well, I'm not. Mr. Payne. Uh, what's that? It sounds like every bell in Philadelphia. Bells? Can someone be dead? They sound too full of joy for that. Oh. Perhaps we'd best go see him. Mr. Payne, Mr. Aitken, and I have just came. There's been a battle. The Red Coats fired on the minute men at Lexington. Good heavens. But who won? I may drove them back, sir. The people are talking about raising the militia. I'm going out. Maybe a few courageous men can stop it. I'm going to. Wait! <laughs> stop it. <laughs> what do you think of that, Tom Payne? Where did you come from? Lexington, Concord. It's all true, you know. I knew it had to happen. That's what I like about you, Tom Payne. What's to be done about it? Why, after a few minutes? Thirteen colonies spread along 3,000 miles of sea coast, all wanting something different, all with petty jealousies and conflict. One thing they have in common. Yes, if they had the sense to see it. What do you think they want? Independence. Doubtless. But how many men now, in April 1775, believe as you do? No, some. Some is not enough. Then there must be more. Someone must tell them. Someone must burn that word, independence, on their hearts as though it were written in the point of steel. And who is to do that? Why, well, I will, if no one else. So you'll become a revolutionary pamphleteer, eh, hey, Tom Payne? I'll become whatever I must become for the cause of freedom. Then you should know this. There'll be no turning back. You'll be swept into the very vortex of it. You'll make converts, yes, but you'll make enemies as well. You'll be misunderstood, reviled, persecuted by men of your own time and of generations yet to come. There'll be no peace for you, Tom Payne, now or hereafter. How do you know this? Who are you? You've asked me that before. Now I want to know. Very well. I, Tom Payne, am the first and last citizen of a country known as the United States of America. A country that is yet a dream that may or may not become reality depending greatly upon you today. I am not one man. I am a nation. I am that posterity which one day may judge you, but which you today must judge whether it is worthwhile to you that I shall be or not be. It is said. And now you know. Not that I care now, but... Um... Is there no reward for one who fights against the tyranny of this time? Yes, Tom Payne. And perhaps someday, when your need is greatest, I'll come and tell you what it is. It's a small matter. I've made my choice. So you have. Listen. That Tom Payne will someday be known as the spirit of 1776, but that's still four eight months away. Oh, yes. But if men will believe what you and I believe, there'll be that sort of spirit in 1776, won't there? That's only common sense. Isn't it, Tom Payne? Yes. That's only common sense. <laughs> They never thought at first that the obscure editor Tom Payne wrote that pamphlet, Common Sense. But the words went wailing through the countryside like an alarm. You remember those days, Tom Payne? No more metaphysics now. Then the doctrine of reconciliation to the touchstone of nature. And you tell me, when you give her the life, Honor, 
and faithful serve the power that has carried fire and the sword into your land. For what you say, if we still pass the violence with you, and then I ask, hath your house been burnt? Your property destroyed, your wife, your children, destitute. Have you lost a parent or a child? If you have not, then you are not a judge of those who have. But if you have, I can still shake hands with the murderers when you are not worthy of the name of husband, father, friend, or lover. You have the heart of a coward and the spirit of a scout. Listen, they believed you and they fought for independence. But even that was not enough. 1776, the fall of 1776. Do you remember that? You remember the army of General Washington, what was left of it? Poor wretches driven through the mud and sleet of northern Jersey. Hungry, freezing. Well, gentlemen, it's hard enough to say it, General Washington, but... We will profit no more baking at the facts. We're out of ammunition, out of food. They've got us on the run. Most of this I blame on you, Mr. Payne. On me, sir? Yes. It was your common sense that first persuaded me to independence. Oh, I've never wavered since. But I tell you, not for 20,000 pounds a year would I endure what all of us have endured for faith alone. Son... Perhaps this time for variety, it's good news. Captain Marsden reporting, sir. Well? It's more desertion, sir. Whole company this time. Where did they go? Home, I suppose, sir. Home. I wonder how much longer any of us will have a home to go to. Well, thank you, Captain Marsden. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. That's by far the worst of it. Desertions. It's hard to blame the men, sir. No, I can't blame them. But we'll be generals without an army in another week. Now, well, gentlemen, we'll meet again tomorrow and take stock and weigh our chances. Good night to all of you and a good rest. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Are you staying up alone, Mr. Payne? Honestly, yes. I thought I'd try to write some sort of proclamation to the men. Well, good luck to your efforts. Thank you, sir. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sergeant, fetch your pen and ink, will you? Yes, sir. It's right here. There you are, sir. Thanks. Uh, Sergeant, you're a plain man. You know what the rest are thinking. What has happened to us? Why are they deserting us? Well, sir, the more we're thinking, it's more than like a food and ammunition. There's something gone out of the men that used to be there. I know, but what's the cure for that? Well, that's up to you, sir. You're our leaders. We're just plain farmers. Jay, you have to look to when things are bad to tell us where we stand. Tell us the worst of it, then tell us what to do. We'll follow you. You think it's as simple as that? We've done it before, sir. We've never stopped believing in what we're fighting for. If you'll show us how we can win, well, then we will. You haven't lost your courage, have you, Sergeant? No, sir. Good night, sir. Oh, thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, Sergeant. Right, you know, Tom Payne. Why are you here? To tell me that I failed? No. Perhaps to tell you what will happen if you fail. No need of that. I know. And I've tried. The words won't come. This is crisis, Tom Payne. The last crisis, I'm afraid. No, not the last. There'll be others. But there'll be something else. Let me see if I can show it to you. Look. A United Nations stretching across a continent from sea to sea. 130 million people living and working together, governing themselves in liberty and justice. The sworn enemy of all tyrants and oppressors. The hope of the whole world in time of trouble. The leader of the world in time of peace. Can you see that far? I've seen it in my dreams a thousand times. It's all I've hoped to live for. All my faith. It's been a religion. 
I spoke to you once of a reward. That would be my reward. But there's a special one reserved for you. If you triumph now, this shall be your reward. Each time hereafter that this great nation is in crisis, your words again will guide them and inspire them. There will come a time nearly two centuries from now, in such a crisis as you cannot now imagine, when a president of those United States will carry these words of yours into every home throughout the land to give this nation hope and confidence. All this shall happen if you triumph now. But why must you place this terrible responsibility upon me? I have not. The times have. Times to try men's souls. The pen. Right. Yes. These are the times that try men's souls. Good night, Tom Payne. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. Remember how the words told them, Tom Payne? How the men came flocking back into the ranks when it was all over? They said that without Tom Payne, we never could have won our independence. And afterwards they said, never were words written so vital to the outcome of a mighty cause. Listen. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier. And the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. I call not upon few, but upon all. Up and help us. Lay our shoulders to the wheel. Let it be told to the future world that the city and the country, alarmed that one common danger came forth to meet and to repulse it. Throw not the burden of the day upon providence, but show your faith by your works. That God may bless you. Now, Tom Payne, after so many years, I find you here, bedridden, and of a certain age. And I. Yes. But you have no regrets? No. None. You are satisfied with all that's passed between us. More than that. I'm more grateful to you. And now the day is over. The sun has gone down. At last, the darkness comes. Are you ready? Yes. Give me your hand. Where are we going? Into another time. Another time. I'm old and spent. Will there be a place for me? A place for you. Always, Tom Payne. As long as men love freedom, as you have, enough to die for it. Rains and thank you, Ray Collins. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments we will hear from Mr. Rains again and also announce our program for next week. Meanwhile, in connection with our story of chemistry, Gay Whitman now quotes from the Japanese Times and Advertiser.
From this newspaper, a Japanese propaganda radio station recently broadcast, in effect, this threat. Our enemy recites a poem of figures about United States production. Figures, however, cannot fight. Soon, quite different figures will fill the people of America with unrest. The announcer went on to name, among some of the things he was positive would soon put America out of the war, a shortage of camphor. The answer for America is, you'll have to think faster than that, Mr. Hirohito. America isn't going to have any camphor shortage, thanks to chemistry. Why do our enemies hope the United States will run out of camphor? Isn't camphor only a drug used in medicine? No. Today, America uses six million pounds of camphor a year. To name one important product in which camphor is used, there's the plastic made of cellulose, nitrate, and camphor. Because of that use and other uses, a shortage of camphor right now would be a serious upset, it's true. But it's true also that only a few years ago, our camphor supply might easily have been cut off. Natural camphor is distilled from the wood of camphor trees on the island of Formosa. We've tried to grow the trees in this country, but without much success. So Japan, only a few years ago, could let us have as much camphor as she liked or as little. And there was nothing much we Americans could do about it. In fact, the Japanese used to squeeze us every now and then on purpose to get the price up. In 1918, another year when we were at war, natural camphor sold for $3.75 a pound. But today, America's vital camphor supply will not be curtailed, nor will the price go soaring. For eight years ago, a DuPont manufacturing plant began to turn out camphor in quantity. How is it made? From turpentine, which is extracted from pine tree stumps of cut over southern timberland. Turpentine from the stumps in a complicated chemical process becomes synthetic camphor. And this chemically made camphor is actually cleaner and more uniform in quality than the natural product. And it costs not $3.75 a pound, but something like a tenth of that amount. Most important of all, DuPont is making enough of it right now to take care of all of America's essential needs. Here is a graphic and convincing illustration of practical chemistry at work. A grave wartime threat to America's industrial machine has been averted by DuPont, which brings you in peacetime better things for better living through chemistry. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our star, Claude Rain. <laughs> Of all the men who inspired in America the world to be free, Tom Paine was outstanding. Today, every civilized nation in the world is in mighty conflict to determine once and for all time whether those who think as Tom Paine did will continue to build a better world or whether freedom and liberty will disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Claude Rains. Next Monday, on the Cavalcade of America, DuPont will present another original radio play. It's titled, This Side of Hades, the thrilling and romantic story of the heroine of the Revolutionary War, Molly Pitcher. The star, Loretta Young. Monday night at the same time, Loretta Young as Molly Pitcher. DuPont is happy to remind you that Claude Rains is now to be seen in the Warner Brothers production, King's Row. And Ray Collins will soon appear in RKO's new picture, Then and Williams, The Big Street. The musical score for tonight's program was composed and directed by Robert Armbruster. This is John Heaston sending best wishes from DuPont. Thank <laughs> you.